Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble. I am excited to be here with my friend Chris SD from Sync Songwriter. Gosh, I can't believe I haven't had him on the show yet. We've had the show going for two years, but I think I interviewed him just a little bit before we started the show on my other podcast. So I'm excited to dive into all that's been going on with him and how he helps musicians. But before we get started, um, Chris, I'd love to have you just let people know a little bit about your music background, how you got into music and what you've done in music up till now. Absolutely, Bree. Uh, thanks so much for having me. This is this is totally awesome. Uh, I have always wanted to be on your show. So <laughs> <laughs> this is fantastic. I uh, just in a quick nutshell, um, I started off probably like a lot of your listeners and viewers. You know, I started off as a musician in a band. I was an honor student in, in high school in grade seven and grade eight bombed out in 11 and 12, figured it education wasn't for me, went to college for about a year, dropped out because uh, I realized music was my path, you know, and uh, so jumped into a band and toured around and we had some uh, actually really good regional success and then uh, got into um, producing records. I really wanted to understand what the magic was about producing and engineering and so on. So I did that. Uh, for a while, and I had the good fortune of winning some awards uh, up in Canada, Toronto, won some Juno awards, and uh, they gave me a special green card to come down to Los Angeles and uh, and do the same thing. So um, that's the uh, the essence of what happened. And along the way, uh, while I was being a producer, one of the things that happened was I would work with big artists who had agents and labels and all these you know entities pushing their career along. And I also worked with indie artists, you know, and a big part of the indie artist experience was working on really great songs, putting our blood, sweat and tears into records. And then uh, the record goes out and it's crickets. Nothing happens with it, you know. And I thought there's got to be a better way, you know. And uh, that was when I stumbled across uh, sync licensing, you know, licensing music. I didn't know anything really about it. I just knew there were some people that I didn't really know that made a lot of money and for very little work <laughs> with their music. And I was like, what is this? So, and that was at a time when it wasn't really that cool, you know, to get your music into TV and film. A lot of people felt it was selling out. Like, oh, you got your song into an ad was like the worst, you know? Um, but, uh, you know, slowly people started to figure out that, you know, this is an, a, a bona fide revenue stream, but more importantly, is that you can find uh, a congruency between your music and what it goes into because you can refuse anything you don't have to be in a reality tv show you can go for the shows that you love that you know your fans love right would not be amazing to be you know, like in a show that that everyone you know the people that you're kind of um that are your fan base love as well so that's really kind of how i got into sync um just starting to help indie musicians and i failed really badly at it at the beginning i was like you know, cold calling music supervisors, like, you know, and of course nobody would write back to me. And I was like, man, I, I, I should have some name in this industry, but it wasn't the TV and film industry, right? I was in the music industry, but slowly I, I started to make those connections and slowly built up and figured out how this whole thing works and uh, got more and more friends and in the industry. And, and now I uh, just have a, a lot, a lot of contacts in uh, with music supervisors and, and music licensing. And uh, what I do now a lot is besides working at my studio and producing records is I introduce indie musicians, songwriters, producers, composers to music supervisors directly. And that's how um, we've gotten so much uh, sync success um, at Sync Songwriter. That is such a cool place to be as far as like helping musicians get over that gap, right? Because it, so much of it is relationships. And it's so hard when we don't know anyone. 
So I love that your passion is really to help musicians connect with the supervisors. Now, before we get into that, I just want to like clear up some of the terms because I know we a lot of these have become like buzzwords in the last five years that you've been working in the industry and, and people have really been getting excited about music licensing. Like what exactly is the term music licensing and sync placement? Like, are those the same thing? How does that all work? Yeah, that's a great question. And so a little, you know, a one-on-one kind of overview really quickly. So essentially all is very simple. There's a lot of complexity in some of the contracts and things that you don't have to know any of that really to be successful. Really what you're doing is you're licensing your music for a use. So basically if I'm a movie studio and I want a, you know some music in there, I can hire a composer, I can have an in-house uh, you know, composer or songwriter or something like that, which normally costs a lot of money, or I can go out and find music that's already been done. I can go to sync agents. I can go to libraries. I can go to individual musicians. And, and of course I hire a music supervisor, right? So I'm in the studio, I normally hire a music supervisor and the music supervisor's job is to go out and find the music. And so they find the music and they make suggestions to me based on what I've told them I'm looking for. And so say you're on the other end and, uh, you know, you happen to know this music supervisor, you're introduced to this music supervisor through sing songwriter or something, music supervisors, hears your song and they say, Brie, this is awesome. Like, this is great. I really think this would fit in this film. So they take your, your song, they bring it to me, the, the, you know, the director, pretend I'm the director of the movie. And that, like, this is exactly what I'm looking for to tell my story. You know, this is really uh, the synergy between the music and the film is fantastic. I want to use Bree's song. So then the music supervisor comes back to you and says, the movie studio would like to license your song. It doesn't mean own your song or, you know, or anything like that. There's, there's no, uh, you're not giving up copyright or anything. You're literally getting paid cash to let the movie studio use your song in their movie. And you can take your song and you can license it, not to one movie. If you have a good song, you can license it over and over and over and over again. You can get into shows and ads and all, all kinds of stuff all at the same time. There's no real restriction. There's lots of artists who have had songs synced over and over and over and over again in lots of different opportunities. And the money, and you know, is called the sync fee that you get. And that money that you get as a sync fee is often in the thousands of dollars, you know? Sometimes it's like a couple of hundred. Uh, I've gotten an artist 30,000. You can get a hundred thousand if you're in like a huge, you know, it's rare, but you know, usually reserved for bigger stars, and they might get like even half a million dollars if they're in like a Super Bowl commercial or something like that. So, you know, there's a huge range of sync fees, but the bottom line, it's it's usually a big chunk of dough for what a musician's used to making. So that's essentially what music licensing is in a very simple exchange, you know, between the music and the media. Got it. And is every deal totally different? Is there any standardization in, in the industry? And also, I was curious, like, is it just a one-time fee? Or sometimes do you get, like, you know, if, for example, something is going to be on a streaming service for, you know, the next five years or whatever, do you get paid constantly? Or is it just totally different with every deal? Um, so that's a great question. So this one standardization is that you get a sync fee up front, which can really be anything, you know, it could be free for your friend's student film. They're in film school, right? Uh, reality TV generally doesn't pay very much. You might get several hundred dollars for that. Uh, then you sort of move up the chain, you know, into like, you know, cable, uh, some cable shows, you know, background part might be like a thousand bucks or $2,000. And then you start moving up into the more popular ones and you're getting into four and five and $6,000. And then you're, you know, as it goes, you get onto a prime time thing, you're moving into 10,000. Um, you know, I can get 20 and 30 and, you know, which I, you know, I shouldn't probably mention the show actually, but I have another, uh, member of our community who got $20,000 for a popular, popular show. So, you know, there's a big range, but the standardization is you get a sync fee up front and then you also get back end royalties, your performance royalties every time that the show is aired. This doesn't happen in film in the United States. It happens in Europe and Canada, but 
Hollywood somehow got out of that and they, they, they don't have to pay the royalties there, um, but they pay a big sink fee up front. But for anything to do with television or ads or, you know, streaming, things like that, you'll typically get back end royalties, which come through your performance rights organization. So if you're with ASCAP, BMI, SOCAN, if you're in Canada, um, you, you know, every time that show airs, you end up on the Q sheet, which is basically a sheet that, you know, marks uh, what shows are have been aired. And uh, every time it airs, you get a royalty there. So you have can have a constant stream of money coming in through the back end. Now imagine if you get several sinks, let's even like, you know, one every three months. So you got four a year, you know? Uh, can you imagine you get those four sink fees, right? Every quarter. And then you get the back end royalties from all four shows every time that they're airing, you know, or they're if they're on streaming or whatever. So it's it's pretty awesome. You know, it's a very can be a very lucrative way to get a huge fan base, get amazing exposure. Um, I'll just say one thing quickly. You know, a lot of musicians and artists I talk to, the money is surprisingly not the first thing that they think mm -hmm. about, you know? And it, it's really about the exposure that they get, which of course is amazing because you're riding on the coattails of the of the TV and film industry. If a show or movie is doing really well and you've got, say, just a show, and you've got millions of eyes and ears watching that show and your song comes on, right? There's going to be a fraction, not even half, but there's going to be a fraction of people who Shazam that, who are going to be like, I do that all the time. I hear like a song in a, in a, in a bar, a restaurant, in a show, in a movie. I'm like, what is that? You know, and I'm looking the lyrics up or Shazamming it. That's thousands, perhaps millions of people hitting your song all at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a massive, massive bump. And uh, there are artists who have gotten in the charts with just one good sync placement. So it's a very powerful way to get this massive exposure for yourself, which is, I've always found super attractive, you know, for any musicians helping them. It's like, guys, this is like an amazing path if you do it right. Now, there's a lot of... um the path is littered with failure, you know? There's lots of people, probably people listening here who have, oh, I tried that, you know, or I'm in a library and nothing's happened and so on. That's true. For I would say 95% of the people who 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 try to do this, it's it's generally failure um, unless you are doing it the right way or you have the right person representing yourself. And that's really where I come in. That's the trick. And that's how we've gotten so many results at Sing Songwriter. Yeah, I know you're you're very big on connecting with supervisors and relationships. So what do you think? And not that these don't work. I know that they do work and I have people, I know people that use them, but like, why do you prefer going directly to the supervisors versus going through a library or a sync agent? Yeah, so that's a great question. So, you know, the thing about libraries and sync agents, I'm definitely not coming down on them. There are some fantastic libraries and fantastic sync agents out there. The whole trick with that, though, is you have to be on the front burner with them. Like you literally have to be top of mind and not just once, you know. So the way it it works, if you think about being in a library, a little bit like being in a big um, box store and you're like a, a can of soup, right? You're You're like, here's my brand. Here's my music. Here's my flavor of what I do. And you're sitting on a shelf in this roster of all these other people who are in the library, right? All the other cans of soup and all the other things that 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 are in this big box store. Music supervisor says, "I am going to go to this box store and find myself a song." The music supervisor goes in, selects one of the cans of soup or whatever else they're there for, and walks out. Music supervisor wins. Box store, they win. They go, every time the supervisor comes in, they walk out with a song. Now, the problem is that you're the can of soup on the shelf. So the chances of them picking you are super low, right? So people can say, you know, libraries and sync agents get lots of sync placements. And it's true, they do. But to be an artist in the roster, it's a different side of the coin. Like it's your, the chances of you being picked for that are, are low. And I figured that out early on. You know, I, I didn't want it to be a lottery. I wanted it to be something proactive that could promote the independent artist music that they could make a living from if they were able to do it consistently and you know and had the talent for writing the songs and producing them properly and then approaching it properly and the way to do that is kind of like a lot of other things in life 
it's like it's about having relationships with the people who can make it happen for you. So I knew that. And I knew that all I've got to do is take artists that I think have what it takes to, to make this happen and connect them with people they would never normally be able to connect with. And my my name's on the line too, right? Because I I bring people to the supervisors. The artists have to be, you know, to a certain standard. You don't have to be great. You don't have to be like as good as the latest record on the radio. You just have to, you know, know how to write good songs and the rest takes care of its of itself. I'm a music producer. I help people produce records and all that stuff and get it all ready. But the bottom line is those relationships are so important. And it's about connecting with the right people in TV and film to make it happen on a consistent level. And there's no real way around that, you know? And um, it's just the way of of things. Now, is there any genre that's like more popular for sync? Because I feel like when I watch TV shows, like the genres are all over the place. Like I have seen, you know, like big band stuff. And then I've seen like super ethereal stuff and total straight up pop. Like it seems like they've and jazz and, and everything. So it, does it matter what genre you're in? Should people be writing for a particular thing or should they write what they are good at writing and just hope that that's what people are looking for? Bree, you were such a good interviewer. <laughs> <laughs> you like ask the best questions. So that's that's those that's fantastic. It hits it right on the head. The thing about writing music for sync, which is which is I'm glad you asked that, is that you should never feel like you need to write for sync because music supervisors will have told me this time and time again, right? My friends would hang out with them and I'm on the phone or we're talking about some new artist or whatever. Um, they're always about authenticity. They want to have authentic music. They don't want to have music that sounds like it was made for the part. Now, that being said, there are people who are really good at just making music for sync, you know, who, who are good at that. But it's kind of far and few between. And the best way to approach this as an artist is really to write music for you, your heart, your soul, your fans, the 13 year old self you know, inside you that needs to approve it, write for the authenticity, write for the real reasons, and then find the opportunities that fit your music. Mm -hmm. So you don't just write music and, and it's not like a shotgun approach that never works. You know, you don't just kind of put your music out there or start firing emails off or whatever. It's going to, you'll end up like I was when I first got into sync. It won't work. Trust me. Uh, what you want to do is you want to be able to target your music. You want to be able to Pick the opportunities that you know your music's going to fit into and go after those specifically. And that's a whole other conversation. But that's really sticking to what you love to do. You attract your fans and you get your music into TV and film and even and then reinforce that uh, reach that you've got, you know, make a big splash with that that way. That's right. I mean, you know, if you're going to release that music anyway, and then you get this big bump from getting a sync from it. Like, how awesome would that be, right? Totally. That's exactly it. You you do these things in tandem. Like, I wouldn't ever say to an artist, you know, quit touring if you tour and just work on sync. You know, you should be doing all of these things, not just because, well, to put it in another way, they all just go together, right? They all, they all feed each other. So it's important to do all these different types of things. Uh, another really important thing that people miss out on a lot is that they forget to make sure their music is out there when they get the sync placement mm -hmm. and they miss out on that big bump you just talked about. It's like people Shazam it can't find it. Right. So always have your music out there. A question I get a lot is, is, you know, can I use a song that I recorded years ago? Like, will that work? And it's, of course it can totally work. It just depends, you know, if it doesn't sound too dated or even if it does sound dated, it should go into an opportunity that's looking for that dated music. Again, targeting. But you can use songs that you just wrote, songs that were released, and it's not going to matter. It really won't matter whether the song was released or not. It's it's fair game. Yeah, the question that I get all the time is, shouldn't I not release my songs because I might get a sync placement? Like they're afraid that once they release it, somehow it's like old news and the sync people won't won't care about it anymore. 
No, not at all. That only matters if you're like really famous or maybe semi-famous where they sometimes like to get the scoop, you know, like mm-hmm. when Billie Eilish wrote that song for the James Bond film, you know, they, it was a big deal, right? They had to write the song and then they produced it for the film and then it got released when the film was released. So it was a part of the film in a way, you know, the whole promotion, right? So that is in those cases, if you're not Billie Eilish, then don't worry about it. Music gets picked all the time that's been released. Like it, yeah, it doesn't matter at all. Cool. So I still have a few more like technical questions that I think our audience might be wondering about as well. So I'm going to, I'm going to, since you're here, I'm going to pick your brain, but what about cover songs? Can you present cover songs as potential sync placement? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It happens all the time. In fact, that $30,000 sync I was talking about that I got that artist was a cover song. So you, uh, the beautiful part about cover songs is that they're already recognizable, Mm -hmm. right? So you're not kind of having to teach someone's ear a new pattern, you know, a new, your, your own kind of flavor. They don't even have to learn it. It's like, oh, I know this song. And they're flooded with emotions already. They're, they're memories and, you know, associations with that song. But the trick is when you're doing a cover song that's hyper important is not to imitate the original version or the most, or something that's been done before that's popular. You have to bring your own spin to it. You have to do it in a different way. It's got to be something that is novel, right? So, so much of success in music, period, whether it's radio, getting signed to labels, you know, TV and film, of course, and all these other different things is music has to have familiarity to it, but with a twist. So it's got to sound new, but like not too new. It, you mm-hmm. know, you don't want to be totally avant-garde where people just don't really understand the music, you know? It's got to be something where people say, I know what this is. Like I can speak this language, but I love what they're saying. You know what I mean? That that that's really a big secret of the sort of how to get your music out there. It's like you walk out on, you know, you extend your hand in a way that people understand when somebody puts their hand out for a handshake that's everybody knows that right covid kind of messed with that <laughs> yeah. a little bit but, you know no, normally when someone puts their hand out we all know a total stranger if they put their hand out we know what that means right mm-hmm. but the actual handshake and the conversation that follows the handshake or what the conversation is about because of the handshake or vice versa that is the novelty it's a different person it's a different topic you've never discussed with them before, you know, and that your music should always have that element, you know, if you can. So not, not too, too familiar all the time because it's boring and not too avant-garde, but somewhere in the middle. Makes sense. So as far as like the payments for sync, are you being paid both on like the songwriter publishing side and the master recording side? Is it all like rolled into one? You know, what if you've got a song where you're like a co-writer, but then you own the master? How does all of that work? Right. Well, that's that's a lot for for right. You know, no, I know you maybe job. just like a, a quick thing, yeah. overview, but yeah, obviously yeah, yeah. there's so, a lot of crazy technical stuff. Yeah, no worries. So so basically it's the it's a slightly complicated because it's different for each medium. So for example, micro licensing, that's when you have your music in, you know, online stuff like YouTube or, or like if you're one of these big sort of libraries that have like a batch payment um, Mm -hmm. for things. So let's say you get it into YouTube, for example, Uh, you get paid a mechanical uh, royalty. That is not what the mechanical royalty used to be on records. Uh, but but they've been assigned a mechanical royalty, which is kind of like a master royalty. Mm. And the only way to get that mechanical royalty is you have to belong to a organization that collects those. So um, there's you know a number of of you know different organizations out there that that do this kind of thing. But the bottom line is is that each time e- for each medium it's different. So if, if it's TV and film, you're getting your sync fee and then your performance royalties, right? You're not really selling. There's no master payment, for example, in that scenario. If you have a publisher, that throws another thing into it. So it's slightly different for each thing. But in general, the thing to remember about this is that you should get a fee up front and then you should get these royalties. Now, one thing that is um, a bit of a strike against libraries and agents, the way I discussed it before, is that they, of course, make their living by taking a cut, right? Right. 
Yep. So it used to be where they used to take just a cut of the sink fee. They used to take a minority share in it. And it's progressed and grown where they've taken a larger and larger one. Uh, often you'll hear they're taking half, you know, and then they also want part of your publishing, which is your, your backend royalties, right? Then they want to have some of that. So they take a, a part of that. And then some people even, I've even heard in their contract, they have like in perpetuity it means they you're supposed to sign with them for life like for the for this for the song like that they they have full control over how it's chopped or whatever forever no matter what changes in your life forever which is bad news to me you know you should run from that uh you certainly don't want to sign an in perpetuity agreement if you can help it um so there are certain downsides to signing with with libraries and and agents it can work great if they've got a vested interest in you, you're on their front burner, they've got several of your records, they've already gotten you 10 sync placements, and they're and they're still rolling, it can be good, right? But unfortunately, it's not typical. That's the problem. So I've always been a fan of cut out the middle person, go straight to the gatekeepers, go straight to the music supervisors. Now, you can't just reach them. I don't teach people like how to just, you know, oh, just reach out to them and you know, and everything will be fine. You know, you've got to be connected with them. That's, that's the thing, you know, cause there's, there's no easy way. Right. So you've yep. got to, no, you're not just going to Google them and send them a message and assume they're going to read it. I mean, everybody would be doing that. Well, everybody does do that, but everybody would be getting sync placements if that, if that worked, but it's a, it's a difficult thing to do, but it's not difficult if you do it the right way. Totally. Now, since you're produ you're a producer as well, I'm going to ask you this question: Like, what level of production do people need in order to get placed in sync? Like, can they produce from home and be able to produce something that's good enough for sync, or do they need to come to someone like you to like get it polished off? Oh no, I mean, um, I'll bring up a not a very good example, but I mean, uh, Billy Eilish again, you know, and her brother record everything in their bedroom uh, on a computer, right? So there's mm -hmm. that now. You know, Phineas is a fantastic producer, so he's a pro. Um, or he, he became one, you know, we're just working hard at it. But you can absolutely record anything you want at, at home and and have massive success with it. The trick is, is you got to make sure that if you're starting out and you're you're just beginning, you know, this journey, don't waste great songs on mediocre production. Mm -hmm. When I first started producing my friends for beer. You know, I listen back to those recordings and I'm like, kind of cool, you know, but not really, you know, <laughs> I, was, I was learning, you know, I was just learning and, uh, and I got better as I went. My advice to you is to hire people who are better than you while you're learning how to do your craft, if you want to do it at home. And remember, it's important to remember that, um, I just recently did, said this in a blog, elaborated on this in a blog that money and time are inextricably linked okay they they go together um and you can't separate those so if you think like oh i can spend a couple of grand put together a little studio then i get to work at it for free and i'll spend all my time just making my records and doing that you know if you love doing it and you have an income source to pay your rent and your in your food and stuff you don't have to go to work or whatever kudos that's awesome high five good going you know keep doing that but for most of us, we've got other things in our life. Time is money. You know, the time that you're spending trying to do that, you're getting better. So you're building a, an asset, which is great. But in the meantime, you don't want to waste these awesome songs that you've written, you've written on production that's not above the threshold of what you need to get into TV and film. Mm. A quick trick to know if your production level is up to par and above the threshold. It doesn't have to sound like the greatest record on the radio, just has to sound like everything else getting into TV and film. The best way to do that that I know of that's easy to implement at home is uh, take your mix, your, your song, you know, and put it in a playlist with some of your heroes, you know, bands and artists that you love, throw it in that, in that playlist, and then don't focus on it. Go like, you know, start making dinner or something and uh, just listen to it like background music. When your song comes along, put it on random, your song comes along, how do you feel? Mm -hmm. If you felt like, oh, you know, still rocking, rocking out, and I thought my song just fit really well in there, you pass a test. You're, you're good to go. If you felt like, 
oh, this is kind of like a drop in the energy or my my mixes sound kind of small and tinny or, you know, you've got work to do. But that's a good thing because you've discovered what the problem is and you can fix it. So, you know, that's a really good litmus test. So that's a big, long, rambling, roundabout answer to say that you need to have your music above a certain level to get it into TV and film. But it's, but it's again, that threshold isn't super high. You can absolutely get there. And the, my best advice to you is hire people who are better than you to learn from them and also get great sounding recordings while you're working on your craft. And eventually you'll get to the point where you can do it all yourself and, uh, and that's it. Yeah. I mean, basically you got to be honest with yourself. I love that, that idea of putting it in a playlist. I was doing that recently with Christmas music um, because I've got a Christmas CD. And when my song comes on, I'm not like, who the heck is this? You know, like this doesn't belong here. You know, I mean, it doesn't sound as good as, you know, Celine Dion or something, but it still feels like it, it fits the bill, you know? And I love that test. I think that's really great to do that because you don't, you don't want your song to like be that one where they're like, eh, <laughs> you know, this is close, but no. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, we can all do that, you know, no matter we have rose colored glasses on sometimes when it comes to our own music, you know, and we also sometimes get this thing called demoitis mm -hmm. where the, I call it demoitis. It's like you record your demo and in the first three times you listen to it, you're like, Oh, it's a demo. I need to re-record that, you know, but you keep playing it for your friends and your family and you play it because you like it and it's a new song. And all of a sudden you start feeling, man, this sounds great, you know, because <laughs> you're used to it. Like you, 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 it's become, it's, it's grown inside you, you know, and that's not a good thing because it, it, you, you kind of wear those rose colored glasses. So, uh, we've all been on, you can just go to SoundCloud if you want and just start randomly going through songs. And we've all, we all know when, when we hear something and we think, you know, um, it's just not, they're not ready, right. To, to, to get into, to get a label deal or something. It's just not good enough yet. I never, ever think that I'm not elitist in the in the least way. Like the Beatles uh, couldn't get signed, you know? The only reason they got signed by George Martin, the, his story was he didn't even like their music that much. He thought it was good, but he said, when they walked in the room, you felt uplifted. Mm -hmm. And when they left, you felt somehow diminished. And that's why he signed them. Because he said, they've got something about them there's some thing about them and we can work on it and bring it up and i always look at every single artist that way there's no such thing as a bad artist maybe in the moment you're not ready right mm -hmm. but you can get there you know you can absolutely get there you just put the work in the elbow grease in work with the right people get the right advice and you're off to the races bob dylan wasn't a great singer you know but he was great so you know there's a place for everybody. You just have to know how to get there, the right path to get there. Yep, absolutely. Well, on that note, I know that you are going to be doing an event coming up very soon that everyone that's listened and watched this podcast is going to be excited about because we've got, we probably after 30 minutes now, have gotten you guys all excited about getting involved in trying to get your sync, your stuff placed in sync. And so why don't you let them know a little bit about this event that you've got coming up? Sure. Uh, thanks, Bree. So basically, what I decided to do, and I've done this for, I think, three years in a row now, is I every January, I put together a music supervisor panel. So I invite some of my friends who are top movers and shakers in the licensing industry to come onto a panel. You know, those ones that you would have to fly to Los Angeles for and pay for your food and your hotel and admission. I wanted to do this uh, completely free for independent musicians. Just invite my friends out, hang out on this panel, answer questions where you can, you know, meet them, get to know what they're working on, why they pick independent music, how, why they want to pick, you know, use music like yours. And so uh, it's coming up in January. It's going to be on Sunday, January 15th at 10 a.m. Pacific time. So that's Sunday, January 15th, 10 a.m. Pacific time. And uh, we're doing this awesome music supervisor panel. So you're going to meet people who work on the top shows and movies in Hollywood and uh, just get your you know foot in the door in terms of knowing what it takes 
to get them to listen and pick your music. And so this is just a resource I wanted to do for uh, independent musicians everywhere so they really understand and hear it from the actual people who do it. Not just hear it from me, but hear it from the actual people who do it. So that's um, we're super excited. It's always awesome. We get lots and lots of people out every year. So I uh, can't wait. Yeah, it's super powerful event. I have definitely told my audience about it for the last at least two or three years. Uh, so if you guys want to join in that, it is totally free. And you can go to ProfitableMusician.com slash Chris, C-H-R-I-S, Chris, ProfitableMusician.com slash Chris and grab your free spot. There, there are a lot of people that go to this. So make sure that you grab your spot and don't forget it is on Sunday. So put that on your calendar, Sunday the 15th. You're definitely going to want to go. Now, do you um, do you have a chance for them to ask questions or like what, what are the supervisors talking about? Are they just kind of talking about like what they, how they figure out what they're going to you know, choose for as far as music or what their criteria is, what what go to the kind of the subjects they're discussing? Yeah, so uh, we're, it's essentially one big Q&A. So mm -hmm. essentially, you know, we grab questions that come in from from people, and we ask the music supervisors. So show up and, and ask your question. We can, of course, get every question, but we certainly try to get it to as many as we can. And mostly we pick the questions that we're going to cover off if we see like 10 people asking the same yeah. question, right? We're, we've hit it. So all the things that you want to know about what happens behind the scenes in the licensing industry about how music gets picked, you know, why would they pick your music? What do you need to have for them to do that? For that, And then I'm also going to there, I'm going to tell you about how to, how you can connect with them, right? How you can actually connect with these music supervisors on the panel. So it's going to be uh, really, really exciting. And uh, ultimately this is trying to make it like it's got to be real for you right it's got to be real to to so that they're not these people sitting in an ivory tower that that are just in an office somewhere making these really weird decisions these are really cool down to earth people who love music and more importantly love supporting independent music they love that they have friends who are musicians they were musicians themselves so you want to know them you want to get to know how they think and you want to get to understand that behind the scenes stuff. And that's what the panel's all about is for that aha moment to go on for you. And then of course, there's an opportunity for you to connect directly with them, uh, which, which I'm going to talk about on the panel. So uh, really looking forward to it. If you can make it, that would be absolutely amazing. Yes, definitely go sign up. Remember profitablemusician.com slash Chris, C-H-R-I-S. And I hope to see you guys there on that Sunday panel because it is going to be amazing. Uh, anything you want, any parting words you want to say, Chris? Um, I've loved promoting this every year because it is like one of the biggest events, I think, in in all of the, you know, the music industry online for sure. Yeah. So I, I guess the the only thing I would say was I, I was going to do a blog, you know, fairly soon. And uh, another one I was thinking about, like, what I wanted to get across. And I think for 2023, a great theme, a great thing for especially in, independent musicians is there is so much opportunity out there for you now, you know, there's so many doors open that did not used to be that way back when the industry was closed and cloistered. And, you know, it was a funnel that you went up yet because it's so open, there are so many people vying for those spots, those things, right? If you know how to get through to the to the right people and know the the channels to get in, and so that you're not competing a, 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 with a bunch of people, you're only competing against a few people. That is the whole trick. So, give up on giving up. That was my line that came to me. Just give up on giving up. Work smarter, not harder. Know what to do. And coming out to this this music supervisor panel. The Sync Songwriter Music Supervisor panel is going to be a huge step in that exact direction of working smarter, not harder. So, and uh, lastly, Bree, uh, I want to thank you for for having me um, on the show. It's great. I'm always a massive admirer of what you do for independent independent musicians everywhere. Um, you're uh, a real icon. You've been I knew about you long before I was even you know uh, out here doing that. I knew your name and stuff. And it's a uh, uh, I'm really um, you know, happy to to know you and and to have been able to come on here and and uh, connect. 
Thank you. Actually, I don't, you can't really tell in this picture very well, but there's a picture of us up on that, up on my shelf up there of us hanging out in LA. So I, I've really enjoyed getting to know you and everything that you do for musicians and just all the intricacies of music licensing, because obviously that is not something that I teach. So I love being able to be connected with people that do teach it so I can get all the talented musicians that are in my community get get them more opportunities for their music. So thank you so much for opening that up to people and appreciate your time and sharing all of your knowledge about music licensing and sync with us today. And hope you guys are all going to go to the panel. So go um, profitablemusician.com slash Chris. And I'll see you guys there on uh, Sunday, the 15th of January. Thanks for listening to the Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at RondiFay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.